Well, hi. hi How are hi. you? We're good. good. I'm here with the director, Melissa Joan Hart, and the producers of the new remake of Watcher in the Woods. I'm so excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. You okay. guys? We're all excited, I think. <laughs> Whenever I hear the phrase Watcher in the Woods, I immediately have fever dreams of the blonde girl with the blindfold and the whole thing. What do you guys think of when you hear and think about the original film, Watcher in the Woods? Well, you'll find out when you see the remake. No, but, um, you know, the, so the original had, um, well, there was a book first, mm -hmm. which um, was very different from the original movie. And most of the, the movie that most of us know actually had two different endings. Um, so the, the one that you remember wasn't the original ending. And uh, we found Scott here to do a fantastic rewrite, or not rewrite, but write this script so that it was a whole different story. So there's a lot of the same kind of nostalgia from the first one. Um, I haven't seen the movie, I hadn't seen the movie since I was a little girl. I just watched it over and over and over again with my sisters. And so going with them and remembering iconic moments and then Scott writing his own version of the movie and then being able to hold true to a few of the things that were nostalgic for some of the cult fans was really important to us. But I didn't watch the movie again until three days before we filmed. Because three days? Yeah, I waited. And I watched it with my 11 year old, or actually it was 10 at the time. So I could see what was important to him and really what would stand out. And so that was, for me, like, we, we really wanted to make it our own, but we had to hold true to those things that we knew that people would be wanting, you know, that they'd be craving. We didn't want the fans to be disappointed for those iconic moments that they'll always remember. We wanted to be able to revisit those, and we did so, but in our own way. So the blindfolded girl might be a little bit different. You'll have to wait and see. Oh, that's exciting. What other moments do you th did you want to touch on in this? Well, the Neric, writing on the, uh, on the window. We have our own version of that. And, and our own version of the uh, the carnival, um, her reflection in the glass, and that kind of thing. We the we funhouse mirror. Sort of, yeah, we did sort of our own take on that, and um, some misleads and whatnot, if you will. Um, but Scott, you could talk more to this. Well, well sure. Well, you know, when when the project was brought to me, I, I certainly remember. Um, uh, having seen it uh, in the theaters when I was about 18. Um, and really the task at hand was to honor the original, but also to re reimagine it for a modern audience. And as um, Paula and Melissa have touched on, we, we kept some very iconic moments, but also to r bring it to a, a, a modern level of suspense, suspense for a modern audience. Quite frankly, kids know a lot more and can figure out a, a lot more, or just people in general, what's gonna happen. So it was really to build in twists and to reimagine who and what the watcher is. Well, like the end of the um, original movie was a little, it was a little confusing. And I think it was confusing for Disney when they made the movie as well, because they redid it a few times. Um, and so I think that uh, the take that Scott took was, you know, he, he gave it more of a clear sort of, you get a little bit more, you know a little bit more about who the watcher is and what's going on. Um, as opposed to the other one felt a little, you know, there was a sci-fi element to it. So this is really more of a ghost story. And, um, and like, well, do you want to talk, Andrew, do you want to? I want to talk about special effects. You want to talk about special effects? <laughs> and post-production. It's all about the special yeah, effects. Yeah, we're, we're excited to get the project because uh, it had a lot of special effects in it. And we basically, you know, we watched the original film too and all my friends growing up uh, knew about Watcher in the Woods. And uh, we kind of just looked at the original film and updated all the special effects. So the audience would kind of know, you know, the original, but now, oh, here's a whole new, like, new, I can't reveal all the stuff we do, because it's, no, it's be hard. Secret. It's so hard. I want to reveal it, but we do some it. very cool stuff well, with it. Well, like, one of the things, watching it with my 11-year-old, it was so, it was, so one of the devices that they used in the first film was the, uh, the perspective of the watcher. And, um, you know, that's something that's been used, back then that wasn't really used. I mean, maybe Jaws, like, yeah. there really wasn't a lot of that. So, um, you know, that was something that I remember being terrified about, but it's a sophisticated audience these days. People have seen these these devices, these tricks over and over again, and so you know, I wasn't sure how that would play out, but I watched the original with my son a few days before we started filming, and I realized that the thing he was most freaked out about was, who is that? Why are they, who are they watching? Who, who are we? Who are we as the audience watching? You know, what's going on here? And so I was like, that is so important in the movie. So we updated that by using a drone. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I realized that that's something that, you know, that still is haunting and terrifying to people, just not knowing whose eyes we're looking through. So I think that that's a, um, that was an important thing to kind of keep too. And that was something that I think that they used back then, they used in the original film so perfectly. And it was, it, that's just something that I think stands out that people remember. And how did uh, Angelica Houston get we're caught up in this. How did she, what was important to her? I know she's taking the role of Betty Davis. So. Yeah, Betty Davis's role of Mrs. Aylwood. And, um, you know, we every production we make our wish lists. And uh, 
Paula here, mom, <laughs> can I call you Paula, um, had her wish list and Angelica was at the top of it and she said yes. And yeah, so she said yes. It was really wonderful to to uh, bring it to somebody and who, who was somebody who was excited about playing this role and creating it her own as opposed to recreating it what as Betty Davis, Betty Davis did. Yeah. So Angelica really made it her own and I think is creepy and scary but really approachable and uh, you understand who Mrs. Aylwood is. We, I think we make it clearer yeah. who she is in this film than in the last one. Uh, and as an adult now, see, like doing it as an adult, as opposed to being a child watching it, I, um, yeah, I can really, like back then I was only worried about, you know, the girls, like what's ha where's Karen? What's, what about Jan? Is Ellie gonna be okay? You know, this time around being not only the director, but as an adult and a mother, you know, taking it from the parents' perspective, looking at Mrs. Aylwood and what she's lost and what she's after and what she wants and what her intentions are was really fun. So when you pitched this to Lifetime, were they like, absolutely, let's do it? Or did you have to kind of pitch it around? I'm curious. Well, we, so she fought for the rights for 17 years so oh, that wow. I could play Jan originally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a long road. Uh, it took us uh, a lot of years to get the rights from Disney. But originally, this was Melissa's favorite movie. So when we were in doing all of our stuff with Sabrina and that we thought this would be a perfect role for Melissa to play Jan. Uh, it just took us a long time and Melissa aged out of Jan and, yeah, and I, was, I, was, I was too old to play Jan by the time we got the rights and I was too young to play Mrs. Aylwood so I had to direct it. <laughs> oh, so. just, just direct it. That's what I did. Well, it's not your first role in the director's chair. You've done this before but is there anything you brought you think that you're really excited for people to see this side of you? Well, the great thing about this one is it's it's more storytelling than what I've done before. So um, when I got my DGA card, uh, I was, what, 21 on the set of Sabrina, and I did a lot of Sabrina, and that really helped in this case because there's a lot of special effects with this, and Sabrina was a ton of special effects. So I came with a good knowledge of that stuff, which, is, which can be very uh, tricky for directors that haven't done it before. Um, and we did a lot of that in Sabrina. And then I directed a lot of Melissa and Joey, but I directed a short film called Mute um, that we just did independently, and you can find it on iTunes. But it's, um, it stars my little sister Emily, and Emily Deschanel was in it as well, and Gary Marshall makes a little appearance. But I wanted to show a darker side of um, big Quentin Tarantino fan and stuff like that. So I really want to show a little bit more of this, this side of me and this storytelling and be able to like sink my teeth into something a little grittier. And I did it with the short film. And then my next real uh, directorial debut was, um, my real like feature debut was with Lifetime's movie Santa Con, which mm -hmm. was a Christmas movie, which was really fun, but it was back to what I know. It's comedy, it's you know, a little bit more simplistic. And then, so with this one, it was really fun to be able to go back to effects and go back to, you know, just kind of developing characters and relationships and, and uh, you know, not being able to like rely on my comedy background of, you know, so I was out also, of my element a little this bit. Is a, it's a really cinematic movie. Mm -hmm. Melissa did an amazing job. It's such a beautiful grand scale movie. When you look at this, it, this it's very much a feature and she did a tremendous job on it and this really shows what she can do and it just came off beautifully. It's a beautiful, beautiful movie. And a lot of that, so Andrew, so we shot this movie, it, what, 90% of it takes place at night, right? Like it's a huge portion of it takes place at night, but... Uh, in the woods. My producer doesn't allow, yeah, in the woods. And my producer doesn't like to shoot at night because it's expensive. So <laughs> she wanted to shoot during the day. So we had to do all day for night. So that's where Andrew came in. And yeah. we did, you know, we were able to, with what? In the, in the end, I, yeah, in the, in the end, I think it was like 400 something visual effect shots. Oh, wow. Including sky replacements and everything. But it has a, a very cool look, like a real fantasy kind of look, which is amazing, which you don't see on TV that much. And for the budget that we had, we were really able, we really stretched it. And uh, I mean, it's an it's amazing even <laughs> someone who is so close to the project to go back and look at it again is it's just it's beautiful and it's the storytelling is so amazing the the cast was stellar um, you know all the effects turned out so amazing it just it all showed up on screen and I couldn't be prouder well and it really started with the script Scott did so much research and wasn't the first version like 200 pages? Oh my! <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> At least in my mind, yes, it was. <laughs> but, we, we, yeah, but but we did do um, between uh, between uh, you, Paul, and I, and I, and Lifetime, and Melissa. We did a lot of treatments and outlines before we even wrote Fade In to make sure we were really on track, honoring the as I said before, honoring the original, and yet reinventing it for a, m a more modern audience. 
And fun fact, Kyle Richards originally starred in the first in the first film. Yeah. Is she going to make a cameo in this? She's not in this, but I'll tell you, um, Benedict Taylor, who played the original Mike. boy, Mike, who in this movie is Mark, um, he plays Mr. John Keller. So one of the one of the three people that were there in the day that Karen disappears. So he's actually in it. And a lot of his photographs we used for photographs. If you see on my Instagram and whatnot when I start, when I start posting pictures, it's a lot of Benedict's pictures. Oh. Well, thank you guys. You've been so gracious with your time. I'm very excited to see this remake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.